Hi everyone and welcome back to the non-expert guide to African TV and film. Uh, my name is Lola and I am here with my two non-experts, Tolu. Hi, my name is Tolu. I love film and I'm a casual viewer, but I'm a harsh critic. <laughs> she is. And Ibiemi. Hi, very much a non-expert, but um, I believe in the power of creativity to make the world a better place. So I'm here to give constructive criticism on so that. So positive. Well I know. <laughs> <laughs> no one thinking. <laughs> Today, we have a special guest with us. Actually, probably the first expert that we've ever had on this show. Um, he comes to us all the way from Minnesota. His name is Jeremy Bando. He's a filmmaker and assistant professor of screenwriting at Minnesota's Metropolitan State University. As a first time screenwriter in 2008, Jeremy was the first Minnesotan to win the Nicole Fellowship, the film world's most competitive prize for emerging writers. He beat nearly 6,000 entrants to take the $30,000 award for his screenplay Hive, a wartime romance between an American soldier and an Italian journalist in Baghdad. Jeremy also was my screenwriting teacher um, at the Minneapolis Community and Technical College in Minnesota. And he was my favorite teacher. His class is my favorite class. <laughs> teacher's pet. Don't tell the other teachers. <laughs> <laughs> but Jeremy, welcome. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Are you a Vikings fan? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Jeremy, how long have you taught for? Um, I'm starting my eighth year of teaching. Wow, all right. So, expert. <laughs> all right, and you teach screenwriting. Have you taught other courses as well? Um, yeah, I've taught some filmmaking classes and some film theory classes, film history classes. Okay. All right, so well, let's jump right in. Today we are talking about King of Boys. Um, it's a film from Nigeria, written and directed by Kemi Adetiba. So let's go. I have a question for you. I want you to think carefully before you answer. No say consistency. Tabi. Mama, we need to see you. I need to be here. We need to see you. We need to see you. We need to see you. You have destroyed the battle line. Stand up. You have stepped on the tail of the tiger. God's worst punishment in a person. I'm going to read a quick plot summary and then we can jump in. King of Boys follows the story of Al Haja and Niola Salami, a businesswoman and philanthropist with a checkered past and a promising political future. She is a pillar of society loved by many, feared by most, and truly known by a select few as her political ambitions see her outgrowing the underworld connections responsible for her considerable wealth, she's drawn into a power struggle that threatens everything she holds dear. To come out of this on top, she will need every ounce of the cunning, ruthlessness, and strategy that took her to the top, as well as the loyalty of those closest to her. But who can she really trust? The film's A-list cast includes Shola Shobawale, Adesuai Tomi, Jide Kosoko, Osasi Godaro, Il Bliss, Reminis, Tony Tones, Akin Lewis, Demola Adedoin, Sani Mwazu, Paul Sambo, and Sharon Oja. All right. <laughs> so let, let me ask you my first question. If you could say in like one or two lines how you felt after you watched this film. And we can start with Jeremy. Um. I love this film. I thought it was a really ambitious, epic film. I cannot wait for King of Boys 2. <laughs> All right. 
EBM? Um, how I felt. A bit troubled. <laughs> um, do you want me to expound on that? One line. That's fine. We can, okay. We can go I felt in. a bit troubled. Full stop. <laughs> okay. Wow. So. <clears throat> um, I think it was a great attempt at getting a sort of um, mafia type movie done in Nigeria and I applaud the attempt. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's jump right into story, the story. Story, plot, um, in terms of storytelling, because Jeremy does teach screenwriting and the art of story, telling a story. Uh, was it effective? It was a three hour long movie. Was, it, was the storytelling, was it compelling? Would you say? And Jeremy, we'll start with you just because you're new to, or you're not very familiar with the Nigerian culture. So we're curious about what you feel. Um, I mean, in any piece like this, like there's 10, 20 major characters. And I, for me, it was, it was a little bit of a slow burn, but I like that. It's like, you know, turning the page of a 500 page book, you know? Um, and there were enough like unpredictable twists and turns throughout this um and just the character dynamics changed it was, it was just huge tragedy um powerful dramatic storytelling as far as like i'm concerned i i was compelled i was brought into it um and in the last hour of the film i was you know on the edge of my seat and i think that's where you want uh, audience members to be okay totally for me um I thought this, it started off really well. I thought that the plot had really some really great moments. Some, and what I, one of the things I really liked about it was that the storyline drew from, was like culled from the headlines. You got a lot of things that Nigerians are familiar with, corruption, um, you know, money stashed away by politicians, EFCC, the, well, the film version of EFCC, which is the NCCC, um, chasing down criminals, um, a lot of the, that was going on. I thought what let this movie down story-wise was the editing. Um, at three hours, just over three hours, it was too long. It didn't, uh, it needed some, it needed to be more concise. And I th think that the most, some, most, some of the most relevant stories telling must have been left out, which was how did she get from being at the lowest of low to returning to her seat of power, which would have been, like the return of the king, basically, that whole uh, episode was completely missing from the movie. And it just felt to me that the storytelling was empty and let down by not being more concise in the beginning and moving through a lot of the things that we didn't necessarily need to know um, in order for us to have that third act really have the impact she needed it to have. EBM. So I, I said, I said uh, I found it um, troubling because it did have an effect on me. Um, I'm not I'm not very close to politics in any way, shape, or form, or the gangster life or the mafia life. You know, and sometimes when you watch TV and film, you kind of think, okay, that's a Western thing. Um, so for it to be brought to life in a way that was actually quite believable for me was impactful. So it made me think, oh my goodness, there's this whole sort of underbelly um, of society that. I'm sure exists because this story tells it so compellingly and that I'm not aware of. So, so that, that I felt slightly uh, troubled or not tra traumatized, but you know, it was, it was impactful for me. And I think the human element of the story, like the, you know, the huge tragedy that she had, um, you know, the, the many deaths and you know, people try, you know, just scrounging to get to the top as well. I thought that was compelling. I do think I was too long for it to be, I mean, it was, there's, there's no need for it to be three hours. I think the end was actually a little bit, um, I enjoyed the end. I didn't, I don't want to see the story about how she got there personally. I was more intrigued and more sort of respectful of the fact that I knew she was a bad woman. I knew, you know, I knew she had it in her to come back from this big tragedy and somehow kind of make her way back to the top where she rightfully belonged. I think the ability of the story to make you empathize with somebody who's traditionally um, an, a bad person you know, you, you empathize with, it, with the baddie, essentially, of the movie. I thought that's, I, I always think that that's powerful because people are multifaceted, aren't they? Whilst they might be evil in their activities and all that, it was able to tell a very human side 
um, to her, which I completely appreciated. So I think it was a really good story. Far too long. Um, they could have edited it a whole lot better. Okay. Well, yeah, I thought, like Jeremy said, I thought it was very ambitious as well. I mean, I really, I was like, wow, okay, I like how this director is thinking. And she wrote the screenplay as well. Um, I was, I was like, hmm, I, I didn't feel like there were enough plot twists and double crossing that you see in these kinds of films, but I thought she did a great job in terms of even just tackling this. Um, it was such, I felt like it was such a huge idea with so many pieces that how she managed to tie it all together was, was good, but I keep feeling, so I've watched this film twice and the first time I was like, get rid of the first hour and you know, have the rest play it out as it did. And then the second time I'm like, keep the first hour, get rid of the last hour. Like I can't decide what part to cut, but it's too long. <laughs> it's too long. I mean, just about the length, like, and about the ambition of the film real quickly before we jump into the favorite scenes. Sure. Um, I just, I felt like not only, you know, did Miss Aditiba um, uh, write and direct, but she produced it and financed it. And so- as And a, edited. As a, what's that? And edited. And oh, did edited. he edit it too? Wow. Yeah, yeah, she did. So what I felt is that, you know, as a filmmaker to try to make a film like this and to accomplish that is, is just such a, such a feat. And, and so, I think that with a little more time and money, um, consistency in the sound design, like editing, even the writing, um, even the lighting in some of these scenes could have been more consistent. Um, so, so it's not that this isn't this is a perfect film, but and I do believe I'm with you, Lola. I was just like, oh, we could cut a lot of that first hour out because then it really picks up steam when the main conflict comes. Um, Anyway, uh, it's, it's not the perfect film, but it's, it's really quite an accomplishment from a filmmaking point of view. I mean, uh, she's a true auteur, you know, the author of the film. Um, I'm gonna tell the story exactly the way I wanna tell it. And if that's three hours long, that's three hours long. Um, and we can like it or not, but it was, <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing to me. It was, and thank you for that. Anybody else wanna add anything to that? before we move on. I, I, certainly, I certainly got the impression. I mean, I, I, I'm not really good at reading all these credits of who did what and who owns what. But from watching it, I could tell the owner was in charge of editing it. I'm not taking that out. I, there's a reason why it's there and I'm not taking it out. And I could tell immediately. Um, and as a consumer, um, it, it was long. And I wish they could have taken it out. Uh, but I don't know what they would have taken out so that would have made the story better. I just didn't want to give them a full three hours. I'm just thinking, speaking from a consumer, not a tech, technocrat perspective. I just don't want to give you three hours for you to tell me this compelling story, but I don't want to give you three hours. Um, so I think it's one of those things where, and I think we talk about this a lot, where we say, you know, it's easy to tell, it's easy to sort of ramble on. The difficulty is being concise. The, the, the true penmanship or artmanship, you know, whatever, whatever the word is, craftsmanship, I think will come from being concise. Uh, again, the, the, the quote that we've had in the past, that was it. Winston Churchill that said, um, "Apologies for this long letter. I didn't have it. I didn't have enough time to write you a short one, because it takes a lot of discipline and rigor and you know true commitment. I think I'm not. I'm not saying she's not committed. That I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, it takes a lot for you to then sit down and say, whilst this is good, I, I, if I take it out, it would make it even better. As opposed to, I like it. I'm keeping it in. That's how I felt it worked." Yeah, I guess some discipline is required. And I know, you know, yeah. even with this show, you know, when I'm editing, I'm like, oh, that's so good. And we're rambling on and on, you know, and it can be hard. It can be hard to, to keep everything in and, you know, kill your darlings or whatever. But yeah, so do you have anything to add to that? I, I, I think, I think that she, she has an, she has an, she had an expansive view of what she wanted to do with the movie. But I just, I, I, I know that, like you said, it's difficult to kill your darlings. And she just, I mean, she was pr highly praised in the local, on the local film scene for this movie. A lot of people really enjoyed the movie. A lot of people enjoyed the, like it's a saga. It's a really great um, first attempt. I mean, we don't, I don't think anybody, Nigerian movies generally tend to be long. We tend to have a part one and part two in our more local movies and they tend to be three hours or four hours long. I think, she so it, it's funnily enough in in the film tradition of what we have in Nigeria, but she told a kind of a different story, and we were getting a godfather for the Nigerian public, which is great. 
in terms of the conflict, what was the conflict? And I think the first time I watched it, I was very confused. Um, and then watching it again, I was like, oh, okay, now it all makes sense. Like, what was the conflict? Because at first I'm thinking it's the politicians, and then there's this other guy, Makanaki. I'm just like, when, Jeremy, you kind of talked about when the conflict kicks in. Like, to you, what was the main conflict? Um, yeah, that's interesting because it, it was multifaceted. It was just like on one side, the king was fighting uh, Makanaki, and on the other side, it was, um, then it turned into the detective, um, one of my favorite characters. Um, so, I don't know, it was coming at her from all sides, and plus it was internal, and one of my favorite, I mean, one thing that I really liked about her is they set up her duality and her complexity really, really early on in those first 10 minutes. And they even had those two women that sat there and like talked about the different perspectives um, to that one could have on her. Um, but what I really liked is, is at the end of the day, she was just this, this mother and then she lost her two children. Um, and, and, you know, she was losing control of not only her family and her business life, everything was falling apart for her. And then when she was in the jail cell, um, I mean, I was, I was with her. I felt empathy for, for her at that, at that moment um, and through those scenes. So I, th I think that it was a combination of conflicts is what I'm trying to say uh -huh. that, that was pretty effective. Um, honestly, I think that I tried to leave out my like Hollywood centric, like screenwriting worldview when it comes to international films uh, because yeah, it was too long. And, and if this was coming through my class, I would just cut a lot of the dialogue because so many, so much of it is repetitive. When uh, the king's son finds his girlfriend's phone and unlocks it, uh, he challenges her about it three or four or five times. Instead of maybe one line there, she was my sister or something like that. And, and so, you know, I felt like a lot of the scenes were a little bloated of dialogue. Um, but who am I to say that? Like, I thought that this theatrical style um, was really effective, too. So, um, anyway, I'm okay. a little bit of a, a rant. No, no, no. Thanks. That was great. So, um, that yeah. makes sense to me in the sense that Nigerian, a lot of Nigerian, the, I, the, for me, the way I see a lot of Nigerian movies are very theatrical in their sensibilities. So they bring a lot of the stage to film. And so that's why you get a lot, lot of this length. Um, and so that's how, um, I think a lot of films tend to have that sense of, you know, you really have to sell a scene as opposed to being concise and emoting, like using your cinematography skills to tell that story in a way that you don't need um, dialogue to really expansion on the scene so yeah it makes sense to me yeah and even just the language of cinema jeremy because i remember you teaching us this about say, like sometimes if we're gonna say a whole line in real life right but on screen you cut it pretty much you know if i'm gonna say oh i'm going to the market to go get vegetables like there's a way that you can say that in in a way that's more concise you know and you cut out and that's and that's how you write um dialogue for film right yeah, dialogue, conversation with the purpose, and you try, you know, all those mantras about less is more, and can we just show that by um, a character getting up and grabbing the bags, and, you know, a, a quick look. To and grabbing a grocery room. list or something. Hmm. Exactly. But I also felt like there was a burden. So Nigeria has three major ethnic groups and over 200, right, um, ethnic groups. And sometimes I feel like filmmakers, especially when they're trying to reach, um, a wider audience feel like they're burdened by needing to appeal to everybody. So there's English in the film, there's Yoruba, there's Hausa, there's Pidgin, there also the religions, you know, just all the pluralities of being Nigerian. And I'm just like, I think that's a, I think that's a lot for a filmmaker to take on as well. I mean, you're already taking on this huge film, this huge idea of a film, and then you have to appeal to Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, Muslim, the traditional African, um, you know, religions and Christianity. I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> Funny enough, that's one of my favorite things about this movie. I love that they that um, any any character switches between Yoruba and English seamlessly because that's what we do here. Um, I mean, everybody was switching between languages. They were like speaking Igbo and English, or, and to me, that's a very natural flow of language that we have in Nigeria. 
Um, and so I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed, the, I actually enjoyed that scene where she was, she was at the beach praying and he was at his uh, Babalao also praying. And that to me just spoke to me about Nigeria perfectly. So I think, I think she did that. I think she actually did, that's one of the things she did really well is represent how we are as a country. We're, we're, we're not just a monolith when we're, we're it comes to expression of our language or our religions. And so, yeah, I think that's one of the things she actually did great. Yeah, but just in terms of the dialogue, I felt like, so somebody say something in English and then they have to repeat it in another language. That true. also, you know, true, true. extends time, you know, screen time. So just, just, a, just a note. Um, so let's talk quickly about, let's go into our favorite scenes. I really want to get into some of our favorite scenes. Anybody want to start? My favorite scene was the family argument where we had um, any her daughter, her son fighting. That was just like a very Yoruba family fight. <laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> it was great. It went on too long as usual. But to me, it felt real. That's how families argue. And, you know, everybody's abusing each other. And then the mother is trying to calm down. And then she too flares up. And so that, to me, that was great because it shows, again, a very realistic representation of how, you know, interpersonal relationships work in Nigeria, where there's respect. You have to have respect for your elder sister, but also you can mouth off and then your mother will tell you off of that. And, you know, that dynamic was really great for me. So that was my, probably my favorite scene. You be, I mean? I think my, well, I had a few, mm -hmm. but the thread, um, the common thing between all the scenes that I liked was anytime, um, um, Eniola was switching between English and Yoruba and she was articulating herself or there were lots of threats being thrown but using um, pro um, proverbs mm, Yoruba yes. proverbs you know where she's not you know because there's something about and when you read the English interpretation you're like nah man <laughs> this thing is missing it is missing the kick yeah. I don't think you all understand what she just said what she just said there, everybody should have been like hey you know when you put this in English if it's in English sound like oh that's deep no 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 this is not deep this is mm -mm. so every time you know she and Makanaki were going against each other and you know um, you know she would say one thing and you know traditionally you're not supposed to use proverbs um, to speak to older, older people um, and he would apologize and say, whilst I'm not supposed to use a proverb, let me come back at you with this other one. And then, you know, it just kept going on. And I think the power dynamics there, because in a sense, you kind of have this almost, un, well, it's not unrealistic, it's this reverence for someone who has authority over you, either because of age or power or money. Um, it, it, it was there throughout. And I felt like, oh my goodness, I felt like saying to every, everybody that was coming up against, I felt like saying, shh. She's going to say another one, and every time she says it, I feel like as if it came with a lot of power. Um, so for me, but that, that comes with understanding what the language is saying, understanding the meaning of the Proverbs itself. So I think, so it had a big impact on me, I suppose. I, I think it would be interesting to, to know from your perspective, Jeremy, how, how those Yoruba adages, which were obviously subtitled in English, the, if you kind of get the, the sense of what they're talking about, not only from the act, not only from reading it, but from the acting as well. Did it did it make as much of an impact on you to say, mm, okay, that's deep, or were you just like, okay, they're just fighting? But I mean, but those those, those were the scenes that, that that had it for me. But I'm, I'll be interested to know from a non yoruba speaking person how how you, how those scenes resonated with you. Yeah, I mean, I think it, they they hit me pretty hard. They hit Makanaki hard. He said, hey, you know. Yeah. You, Quit speaking in parables. Like I got <laughs> yeah. I kept going back and forth with these really deep um, parables and, and and phrases. And uh, I, yeah, it, it hit me pretty hard. I thought they were all pretty powerful. You yeah. know, I mean, a lot of those sayings have a lot of like historical weight to them, and and I think it was it was easy to pick up on that. And I thought her acting was incredible. I mean, I thought yes. that her acting was, was really, really amazing throughout. Yeah, yeah we're, gonna come to, we're gonna come to talking about casting real quick. But let's just go back quickly to themes. Like what kinds of themes were we seeing? I know Tolu, you talked about corruption um, earlier, but what other themes were people seeing? The corruption was there. Actually, one of my favorite scenes was when um, Detective Gobir was 
uh, kind of wrestling with the decision about what to do with the bribe. And you could kind of see it on his face, you know, which way can I go? And I like that you, you always want to put characters in like decision moments like that. And so he's got this money, he could just take it. Um, and, and, he, and he chooses the right thing. Um, and ends up becoming one of the king's allies at the at the end. Um, so I, I thought corruption, and, and it's interesting because I was wondering if the is the NCCC if that was based on a real organization. Yeah, it's based on the EFCC, which is the Economic and Economic and Financial, Financial Crimes Commission. Yeah, which is pretty fearful and frightful in Nigeria. Like you don't want to get into their trouble at all. Well. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Exactly. They have their issues as well. <laughs> Let's not get into that story. I, I want to be able to travel to Nigeria. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Before they find you in Houston. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah, so any other themes? Religion, religious hypocrisy. Family. Thought, right? Okay. Family, the meaning of family. Um, so... One of my favorite things about this whole thing was Tony Tone's acting. I loved her from beginning to end. The younger, um, and the transitional Shola, I mean, any, sorry. Um, and so I, the, 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 the way she brought up Adiswa's character as her own daughter, like I didn't, like, that was one of the surprises of the movie to me, that her daughter wasn't really her daughter. It was somebody else's daughter she had adopted because there, there was no, she, it, you could see that she was training her to be her successor, you could see that, you know, that was her flesh and blood, even though, I mean, she treated her like her flesh and blood. Um, so I think family and this, what family means, because you could see at the end, she was betrayed unwittingly by her son. Um, but, you know, and how, how, again, this is Yoruba family dynamics. And I thought it was very interesting to, to take a sort of look at how, how we treat family. And even though we, um, and family comes in different ways and different shapes and different forms. And I love that, that they explore that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And also the EFCC guy lost his family as well. So, you know, things he traded, he essentially, that money could have been used to save his family. And he, he, yeah. he may have kept, his, yes, yeah, he may have kept his, yes, he may have kept his, he may have kept his, his, uh, his self. Integrity integrity but he lost something lost else and so yeah. that's and we, we look at that that's those are the decisions that we sort of have to wrestle with and lots of people in the efcc wrestle with all the time is it worth it and when you're going against goliaths and you, there's no chance of winning is it worth it is it worth it to make those sorts of sacrifices and i i, I think that was a really well done part of the story as well yeah I also liked, I, was, I said earlier, religious hypocrisy. You know, Eniola is murdering people, but she has this wall art, you know, my, <laughs> fill my couple, Lord, and a screensaver, Jesus Christ is Lord, you know, and she's praying, you know. And I think there was that whole thing at Nigerian society, right? We have the most yeah. churches, you know, in the world and also one of the most corrupt countries. So that was interesting. And also, uh, they, see, they see. had some of their meetings at church as well. Some of those clandestine meetings. I think one was, was right after church. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so, I, I'm not sure. so, yes, I see your point when you say religious hypocrisy. Mm. I kind of saw it more as fluidity, if that makes sense. Mm. So okay. she was an Alaja, but she was an Alaja being a Muslim. But she was praying as you know a, a particular sect of Christianity. All her prayers were, I, mean, I don't think she said in Jesus' name to be fair, but she was very prayerful. So I think I, whilst she didn't, no, but at the end she even recognized the fact that she felt she was playing God. Uh, yet she believed in God. Why are you playing him? So I think it was it's, it's a lot more complex than just you know being. Um, I think than just hypocrisy. Yeah. I think it's more whilst I believe in a higher power of some shape or form and I'm trying to reach this higher power, I also am the higher power here for to, you know, to many intents and purposes and therefore I must be in control. Um, and that conflict, but then realizing that you're not really in control. And I think for me, that's one of the greatest tragedies of that 
that they showed there, which I think people should take away from. No matter how powerful, um, no matter how powerful or successful or in control people are, you're never completely in control. You know, you could see that whilst, you know, she would be out and she'll be this powerful woman who could command, you know, groups of um, touts and, you know, armed people, she couldn't control her son, <laughs> you know, like, um, she felt helpless in, in light of that while she had this incredibly stoic and adisua, my goodness, I fell in love with adisua, incredibly stoic and, you know, attentive and int intelligent but strong daughter who really wasn't her daughter, her own son, her own actual flesh and blood. It was a bit of a disappointment. So I think it, I just like the way they showed her as strong, but then human and then weak and broken and then successful. And I loved that. That, that really endeared me to her. And I think for me, one of the things I take away most of the time from these things is people are just so complex, aren't they? While she can say she's evil, she's stealing money, she's killing people. She, you know, we're drawn into her humanity unwittingly probably even reluctantly, <laughs> but you are drawn in. And I think that's, and I think that's the power of the story for me. Okay. But I don't know why I didn't feel empathy towards her. <gasps> I did not towards Daniela. I was just like, you're going sure. everything right. you've done. I don't even know if it's skillful maneuvering. You're just killing people off, you know? And I just wasn't that impressed by that. And Makanaki How many people did she kill though? How many people did Daniela kill? But we, we don't know because we didn't see that, right? But she killed um, Chief's family, right? The guy that she forced herself to, you know, forced to marry her when he was sick. She killed him, I think, right? Well, that's the thing. You don't know, though, do you? I think we know. Didn't she kind of confess to it? Did she? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I think she alluded to it. <laughs> yeah, I think she was supposed to be this mastermind. And I feel like I did yeah. that. Like, a lot Get of people that. left to... Yeah, you know, to my own imagination as, a, as an audience, as opposed to showing me like, oh, all these moves, you know. I felt like Makanaki at least was a little bit more, um, felt like he was more uh, skillful at that. I completely disagree. Because in the end, in the, notice that there was only one person that turned against her, Makanaki. Every other person, no other person in that movie turned against her. But why? Except, except the politicians. Because she was skillful, because she was powerful. Makanaki and his immediate people. We didn't see people. any of that. Oh, There's it. nothing that demonstrated we, that she was. But there are a few scenes here and there. The scene at the shop where she was selling. Did you not want to buy that fabric? See how she came in and she sold. I mean, she's a big woman. She doesn't have to be selling. I mean, it was a front. But see how she came in and she sold that to that woman. And then the second scene where people sur the, the towel surrounded her car and she was saying to the woman, you know, if I see pregnant again, I'll be very offended. You know, it, it showed subtle power at the end as well. How did she get there? You don't have to know, I think. But I think for me, and I think that's one of the things that really endeared me to her character as well. Many things endeared me to her character. I just like strong women. But anyway, I think you just, you just know that she has power. She has control. At the end of the day, she was still controlling that council from New York over the phone with the same, right, let's get to business. That's, that's real power, y'all. Well, I, I thought it was missing how... Makanaki, yes. Makanaki was just shooting Where guns all over power... the place and killing people. Okay, let's it go is. back. Let's go back. Let's go back to um, us talking about... So for me, I was saying that there was a lot of talk about lion. There was a lot of references made to lion. Lion this, lion that. You know, but this lion, I just felt like didn't really, you know, we were told a lot about the lion, but I didn't see a lot of lion -ry. So Lee, we're gonna, you were going to say something. So, I mean, so for me, because I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with politics, when she was having that conversation with Are about who delivered Lagos for you or who delivered, that to me showed a lot of power. Um, but again, it was just a glimpse of, we didn't quite get that sense of what did she do? What made her so powerful? Yes, she could, she could menace somebody and kill. But how was she, you know, you don't get to that Pace of power without, you know, I, like, did she steal her way there? Did she, how did she entrench her power so much that she became so, she was able to take over his, not only just take over her dead husband's um, um, fiefdom, but also expand it to such a place that all these other characters, the other ones had all died off or had all left, and all these new characters had come to the table. And she was the one who was, you know, who had been there the longest and sort of managed to remain king 
all this whole time and she i mean how did she maintain her power and i just didn't get that sense that we got told that story i enjoyed i enjoyed a lot of it um especially when um tony tones who played played uh, the youngish eniola um but I don't know that we really got that how she became what made her king. We got how she got to the seat, but how did she become a king is the story I don't think was told. Maybe part two will tell us that story. Yeah, well, maybe, because I think the purpose of this story, from what I saw anyway, wasn't so much how she got there, but the conflict and her down downfall. I think I think I think that was the purpose of the story. So I think they they set her up so that you know that she's a big woman. How she got there is yeah, make make that up in your mind. Let's actually talk about the conflicts that she then faced. And I think that's where the story was focusing. Um and then at the end, oh, we're gonna to revert to the fact that she had power. Remember we said she had power at the start, and we know that she kinda of fell apart in the middle, but look at look at her, she's back at the top in some shape or form. So that's the way I split it into the three parts of my in my head. Um, not so much that I want to understand, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to understand, you know, it, it, but they set up the conflict properly. So the detail of the conflict, I think, was good. You know, she lost the political um, promise or she wasn't given the political promise. And um, she really wasn't listening to her children, to Makanaki, because he, he did want to bring her on board, although there was some resentment there. You know, so there were some lines that were crossed or some wires that were crossed and that just, you know, brought everything down for her. So I think they told us, they told me certainly as a consumer, the, the, the story of the detail of the conflict that I wanted to hear. I believed that she was great. I didn't question how she got, how she became the game, but I was more interested in the conflict that she was going to face or that she was facing. Hmm. Jeremy, did you want to add something or no? I don't know. I mean, when she had the hammer in her hands and she um, it showed early on that she was capable of, of great evil, it, it cemented um, her in my mind is like this anti-hero um, who is, you know, who is quite powerful in, in the scenes after that. Sometimes I might think she might have leaned on both her daughter and her right-hand man a little bit more. And I would have wanted to just hear from her um, what she wanted regarding the political ambitions and, and whatnot. Um, I don't know if I, we really, you know, talk all the time about uh, what a character wants, you know. Um, their conscious want. And I don't know that that was set in stone for us early on. Yes, that is true. I mean, for me, eventually I was like, okay, what, she wants to be a minister? You know, and that wasn't entirely clear. I didn't get it the first time I watched it. I think I got it the second time. But yeah, it seemed like she wanted to be a minister. But you're right. And it, that even didn't like, re I was like, she wants to be a minister? That's what she wants, wow. you know? In all of this, like, that's wow. what you want to be yeah. a minister? You know? I wasn't completely. I think what they could have done, yeah, I, I, I completely get that. I think what they could have done, and this is just me pretending like I know what I'm talking about in terms of story, storytelling, is giving us a, a motive, a motivation. Um, say, for example, um, she wants to, she, you know, she understands the fight of the week and she's sort of done all these evil things to get to the top. Now she wants to sort of clean her image so that she can then be this, um, I don't know, some El Chapo character. Um, that is kind of evil, but then does good for the common man, some sort of Robin Hood character. So I, again, was joining the dots in my head, but I don't think it was, I don't think it was explicitly um, sold, or I don't even think the breadcrumbs were, were plain. So even, even some sort of dialogue to say they're sitting up in their ivory towers, they don't know what the common man is. You know, I, I, can, I could have been that bridge between the two, but now I'm too dirty for them. Even something as simple as that would have given me a sense of, right, this is why she's going after this ministerial position. Because otherwise you're incredibly powerful. What do you need that for? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, speaking of her um, as a strong woman, strong female character. So I thought that I thought I was going to see more feminist elements here. And I just didn't feel like, I, I, I mean, there were little glimpses. I felt like she flirted with the idea. And I mean, I'm not saying she has to, but it was just interesting that I didn't feel like she went deeper. There's that scene where she talks to the woman, right, who has six kids and like, I don't want to see you pregnant again. If your husband comes near, you find a stick and hit him with the head. And then when that IRA was kind of lusting after her daughter, you know, she kind of gives him the evil eye. And I wondered also, like, if she had been a male, if we're talking about in real life, is she, she, so she, you, you promised me something. I helped you um, 
win all these elections. I, I delivered. And now you're vilifying me for asking for what I deserve. You know, and I just, I, I thought about that, about how we talk about women in the workplace and how women, you know, if you're aggressive and the way men are, um, you're, you're a bitch, you know. And I, I kind of saw that play there, but I don't know if you guys saw it as well. I, 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 I did, I did, um, but I'm glad they didn't pursue it. And that can sound wrong, like, what do you mean? But I think it would have been too much. I, I'm glad that they were, you know, I'm glad that they, they showed the elements of her femininity or her being a champion of women in those scenes that you said. Um, and the fact that she wasn't, while well, she wanted her son to be strong, she wasn't shy, she wasn't afraid or, you know, she didn't hold back in pushing her daughter to the front as well to say, well, I don't care whether you're a girl or a boy. She didn't talk about it at all. So I think there were feminist elements there. And I think if they tried to go down that route a little, any more than that, it might, it might, it might have diluted the story. Again, maybe in I conversation, think, they could have dropped a few more things here and there just to give us a, a stronger sense of her identity as a feminist, if she was indeed a feminist. I think she, she I mean, there were things that she did that showed that she cared for women. I mean, the first w widow that she, I mean, the first mother, the pregnant daughter that she talked to, the lady with the six kids, even that scene where she has a fight with Are, um, she pushes her daughter forward for the, uh, for the deputy ministerial position. Um, so even with, with, with her ambitions, with that setback, she still thought, what is the best, I mean, what can, what's the best I can do for my two children? And she, I mean, one is her flesh and blood again, and one isn't. And in the two of them, the Are says, we will give your son this position. And she's like, no give it to my daughter instead because she understood the two two of them and the characters and she knew that her son was weak and if she had ambitions for any of the two children you could see her ambitions were were being poured into um, Adesso's character and so I think I think she did she did a decent job with showing that you know Nigerian women in politics in even in powerful positions still have to do a lot they still have to kneel to um their seniors or even their, their power even she's more power in that relationship she, she's the more powerful she's more powerful than are because she was the one who delivered for him in politics that's a big deal if you can deliver states that's an that's a big big deal especially in nigeria because of the way that we're structured and the way our politics work and so she's she's infinitely more powerful because she owns the streets and it's like owning the streets of lagos if you can deliver lagos we know who can deliver Lagos. Um, for the Niger Unfortunately, I can't say it because it's my work. But we know who can deliver Lagos, and we know a lot of the things that go on to deliver states. And so for her to be able to do that shows the immense amount of power she has. And it's something that he, I reckon, couldn't do. But in the end, she's still hampered by, he holds, he holds he's, a, he's a gatekeeper to actual um, effective power when it comes to politics and position. And she was locked out. And it's like, it's a men's club that women really struggle to get into. So she just decided, if I can't get it, my daughter will get that. And I think that was actually, I, th I thought that was a good sort of, you know, I, my generation, I can't do it for myself, but I will be able to hand the baton to somebody who I can then now use my power to push forward and lift up. So I think, I think the way she explored those things that got truncated and somebody else died, but... Yeah, I thought it was good. Okay, okay. All right. Um, that was one of my favorite scenes, actually. Um, Aria and her kind of, it, it felt like two elephants colliding, you know, and then one had to them back forth. down, you know, her, of course. No, um, I think it's important to note that, like, at the very end of the movie, um, you know, she remains king. Yeah, same thing. King and queen. I mean, so... She, she'd been through a lot, but a lot of times filmmakers will, you know, they will say a lot with their like opening and their final images. And with the opening images of this film, there's this aerial shot of Lagos. And then we see all of the different peoples that, you know, represent Lagos at the very beginning. So that's what the story is about. And then in this story is, is the King of Boys and she remains King of Boys at the very end. And so she perseveres, she, she survives. And I think that's important um, kind of feminist, uh, you know. When we talk about feminism in Nigeria, we're in a much different place than we are in the West. I mean, 
we are where you guys, in some senses, um, we are very much in like the early 1900s. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so when it comes to women, we like I had I have into. I'm, like I'm telling you, America, 60s. I'm not telling you. We. <laughs> I'm telling you. I interviewed a woman when I was working in a magazine. I interviewed a woman who couldn't change her name on her passport without her husband's permission. I mean, and this was in 20, no, 2009, sorry. And this was like 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. Um, and we, we are still dealing with a lot of basic things where women owning property is an issue, where, where women, you know, um, widows have pro- uh, problems uh, owning, get, gaining access to their husband's um, property as their widow's portion. So we have a lot of these issues. And so when we're thinking of feminism in the African context or the West African context, I mean, I think she, she touched on a lot of things that are important to women, um, in, even, even if it's a modern middle-class African woman. There's still very, a lot of themes that resonate that you, in, even with Western audiences, it may seem like, you know, oh yeah, we're way past this, but for, for a lot of women who are living this life right now, it, it rang very true about the sacrifices. I know that my boss, uh, when I was working at TW, she had to do some of these things, like courtesy, and, you know, and I'm just like, but this is a woman who, who commands respect. She's, she's a seasoned reporter. She, I mean, why should she have to bend her knee to somebody who is the same age as she is? But because he has more political power than she does, she, is, she has to treat him like an elder. And it's just, you know, we, 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 and we, and funnily enough, that same demand is not necessarily always made of men. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's very, to me, it was, it's very humbling and very frustrating to see this powerful woman have to, you know, get down on her knees all of the time and bow and scrape, you know, when she's, she's already fought for this, for the power that she's had, that she's, she really is on equal footing, yes, on opposite, suppose on ostensibly opposite sides of the field, but really they're on the same side of the road. Um, so yeah, I, I I think that she did uh, sort of a good touching on like she really dabbled well in that in that arena. She did. Well, I also thought that you know her portrayal of like masculinity um, is um, is worth talking about because if you think of the male characters, I mean they're portrayed as um, I mean Gobir is I think the a traditional hero. Um, but all the other characters, I'm thinking of like her son and, you know, his friends. And then that, that gentleman in the Brooklyn uh, restaurant, um, you know, and, and all the corrupt politicians. And so the, all the, a lot of the men were seen as like misogynistic, corrupt. Um, and, and that's the great thing about the complexity of film and interpretation. And that's, you know, you're, you're about to talk about characters and that's what storytellers do is they bring up the entire spectrum of, of, of humanity. Um, and, and they can look at this from a bunch of different angles, race, class, gender, nationality, um, religious views. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a big complexity of, of characters um, across the spectrum here. Um, th- you know, if you think of the King of Boys, there's there's characters that represent um, right away in the opening, like those two women, like characters that she might be um, or she's not. Um, and and that, that scene on the street is, is a great example of that. Like she very well could be that, that poor pregnant woman. Um, so I don't know. That's one thing I really like about film is there's just so much to to analyze and interpret. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. There is one tiny thing, sorry, just before we move on. You see that last scene with the, the tough guy in Brooklyn? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a really, really good um, steady um, personality trait that they showed of her. She knows when to go up. She knows when to sort of back down, but not really backing down. Only God knows what happened to the guy after, after he left her a restaurant. But... Uh, if you remember the, the scene with Are, she stood up and she was, you know, aggressive in charge, but she also knew when to be like, I right, okay, I'm gonna take a step back here. And that again repeated itself. And for me, that just shows she understands the landscape, she knows when how to play, you know, she's a master strategist. Another um, reason why 
I think she is the king of boys, is that she understands the weaknesses of these men who are uh, masochists and misogynists who come off and, you know, are, what's the word that we use these days is uh, toxic ma- masculinity. Masculinity, and she knows, yes. she She knows how to deal with it. And you can almost see on her face, like, oh, I've eaten people like you for breakfast in the past. Mm-hmm. It's okay, have some more beer. <laughs> can someone not play with you again? Uh, yeah? Can someone not play with you again? Drink up, drink up. I think the subject is, is that the King of Boys doesn't fight for Brooklyn. The King of Boys fights for Lagos. Yeah. So she, she was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on this call now. I, I've got more important fish to fry. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I didn't see that. Point. I was like, what happened to the guy? Did they put poison in his beer? What's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go quickly to character. So we talked about Eniola, played by Shola Shubawale a bit, but do you want to expand? Do you want the whole character, like from her from childhood all the way through to adulthood? Uh, yeah. Uh, but I, I, did, I didn't enjoy her child character. I, I liked that they, they told us her origin story, but I thought a lot of it, they could have just started with her as, you know, they could have told a couple of, really, they needed like maybe three minutes to tell us what her childhood's backstory was. We didn't need all those scenes. When Tony Tones came in, I think the story became, like I watched this movie for the Tony Tones scenes because I was compelled by her acting. I thought she knocked it out of the park because she actually felt like Shalash Bowley. Tony Tones, like to me, in her voice, in her mannerisms, her use of Yoruba and English, she, I mean, I think, I, I don't think I've seen a performance like that from a Nigerian actress. Maybe, um, what's her name? The, the veteran actress, uh, sorry, Jai. Okay, so but, uh, Joke Silva. Joke Silva, yes. Maybe, okay. maybe. Uh, oh, yes, or yes. A couple of those women have done it before, but to me, she, um, she really imbued um, Shola Shobo's personality because a lot of that is actually, I think, Shola's real personality. Or Mrs. Yes. Shobo Ali's real person. Sorry, please, I mean, you're a bad girl. I'm so sorry. Mrs. Shobo Ali's personality. Right? <laughs> <I'm sick. laughs> oh my gosh. I know, me too. Let me get into trouble. <laughs> when <laughs> she really did. And I, to me, I, I, I don't think I've seen that in, in Nigerian film before. I don't know if I've seen, and I, I again, you know, that's, but she, um, I, it was such a good, such a good performance. I, I, I was blown away by it. I'm continually blow, blown away by it. I, I think I can watch that movie alone and be perfectly fine with sending that to the Oscars. Okay. And, okay. Any word on Shola Shobo Ali herself? Oh, Shola. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, no, she was good. She, 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 see. She, she, see you, please. <laughs> So I like you that okay, Mrs. Shobo Wale was really good. She was really, I mean, she was I think a little bit over the top for me, but I liked when she was friendly and she was more jocular. I think I liked her person, uh, her acting a lot more. I think she, she uh, when she was doing menace, I felt it was sometimes a little too over the top. But the shouting, I, she to me she was a, a Yoruba woman because I know a Yoruba woman from the streets because Nigerian Yoruba women tend to be very expressive, um, tend to be loud, to have larger than life characters. And I really uh, I enjoyed her acting in that sense. I, I think it was, it was a solid performance, but Tony Jones for me stole the whole movie. All right. BBME, do you want to? No, I, I agree 100% with, with Tolu. Okay. Tony Jones is, she, there was a particular scene, and I think it was when it was that scene in the cell where um, Tony Tones, um, Eniola's younger uh, personality or whatever, younger self came and was confronting her in the cell. And that it was at that point, because obviously they were both side by side, I was like, oh my goodness, she actually sounds like Shalash I mean, you know, her, her mannerisms, the way she sat down on that chair, everything. And I think that just shows great acting chops. Um, I think Shalash Shara, 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 yes, I think um, in terms of the way she, she's generally um, loud, uh, like a typical Yoruba woman, it completely worked for this, for this movie. Um, and I think she knew when to tone it down and turn it up. Um, it, 
and, and when she was loud out of anger in her King of Voice character, was very different and tastefully done in the sense that her loud character when she was a mother was different. So you could tell, it's like, you know, oh, that, that baby's crying. You know, when parents say, that baby's cry is more, and that cry is more, I'm hungry. I could tell that she was, she was able to switch between, whilst I'm still shouting, this one is about, you know, personal pain and this one is about power and, you know, angst and stress for my job. So I thought she did that, she did that really well. Uh, I thought she, she overdid it a little bit, but... Um, yeah, well, there was, a lot, there was a huge Twitter storm about her shouting. But don't is it very Yoruba woman treats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, For a film, you might have to tone it down a little. We're talking about the shouting of... No, 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 no. It, 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 it was a huge thing. It, 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 it was like a, a huge argument on Twitter when this film came out about, you know, the shouting. Why do we have to shout so much in film? Anyway. Because we shout in real life. <laughs> but we shout in real life. That's how we are. <laughs> Are we talking about just her character or all characters that we well, so we're going to talk about at least the major ones. So um, right, okay. well, let's have Jeremy talk about Shola and, and Tony Tone since that we've talked about those two. And then no, I want to talk about Makanaki. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said about Tony Tones and Shola. Um, I think that a lot of times if you want to make your protagonist like powerful, um, you want to have a worthy antagonist. And I thought the acting of like Reminis and, and the actor who played Gobir, I mean, they were really, really powerful um, and, and well acted uh, characters. They were well written characters. Um, so if, you know, if we're, if we're switching over to like all major characters, I thought with the exception of like, I mean, honestly, when you make a movie like this and you're writing, producing, directing and editing, um, you're not going to have, uh, I mean, there's so many actors. I was going through the list and I want to say there was a hundred actors to direct in this movie and so outside of just like a couple of those obvious non you know non-professional acting performances I thought the acting was really really wonderful in here okay yeah I really liked Reminis as well and that was his first time acting he's a rapper you know he's a musician and so I definitely would love to see him in something else uh, I thought he was great well, isn't it um, hinted that uh, he was the silhouette that that uh, the director dropped in the teaser for King of Boys 2. Uh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, I watched a 35 second teaser that uh, Kemi put out and, oh. and, and fans were, were guessing that the silhouette resembles Reminis. And so uh, Makanaki might be back. back. I hope so, because I, I was, when he got killed, I was like, no. <laughs> Well, how about Il Bliss, who is also a musician, a rapper? Il Bliss, who plays Odogu Malay, the guy who came, who, who, who got wind of the money being, you know, stashed in all these houses. I thought he was, I thought he did it really well as well. I thought he was really good. I, you know, to I be honest, so. I enjoyed, I enjoyed a lot of the gangster scenes. There's a scene that sticks to me, sticks to my mind, um, sticks in my mind, sorry. Uh, that scene where they're, they're writing up and that, uh, boys telling a story that to me is such a it's, it's it went on too long what scene it's it's a random scene at, almost at the very beginning of the movie i think the dogu was driving up to um a meeting that when uh, dogu and um uh makanaki first meet oh, yeah, yeah yeah there's somebody who's telling a story i actually really like that for someone who reads it because again it was a very very like you know all those Nigerian boys, all those hustlers, all those uh, what do you call them? What they what are they called now? Uh, area boys. Not a, a, oh. area boys, but yes, very you know street. Alisa. It was it was to me it was it was good. Again, the scene could have been cut into like thirty seconds and him just whatever. But I thought that we had a lot of again realism when it came to character portrayal, even from the secondary and tertiary characters. Um, uh, Ill Bliss did a really, really good job, but I again, I don't know whether we needed so much. We knew, only needed one scene to tell us that he he was menacing and he was um. So it's an I guess it was an it, it is an ensemble story, um, and it was it was rather a story told told by an ensemble cast, but I. Uh, while I enjoyed uh, Ill Bliss and Reminiscence's characters, I don't know, I sometimes felt that they were on screen too long. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's talk about Adesua real quick before we go on. Adesua plays Kemi, Aniola's daughter. Oh, I, I <laughs> loved her. Like, I thought, I thought she played that character of, um, I'm well-educated, I'm extremely cultured, but I come from a gangster home, so don't mess with me. I thought she did that really well. There were a few, I think the, the scene in the car where she kept turning back to look at her mom was a bit ridiculous though, where, where they went to the church to confront mm. someone about the position. She kept telling I, I wanted her to do more. Um, so there was one scene where she confronted Makanaki and I thought even Makanaki's response to her wasn't as um, violent as the response to her. It's, it's almost as if he respected her yeah. but he didn't at least want to cross her. So I thought that was quite cool. And knowing her character that she's played in other movies, I thought this was, this was it's quite good for her to, you know, just stay in your lane. You're supposed to be quiet and deliberate and strong. You're not supposed to be there to try and share the stage with Shalasha Bali's character. Just stay where you are, but keep strong. I thought she played that really, really well. And the, the, um, the dynamics between her and her brother, Keaton, was beautiful as well. Keaton's character was perfect. Like, I literally know people like that in life who, you know, every son. They, you know, like exactly people that have all the opportunity in the world, but then just for some reason aren't able to, you know, lay hold of that opportunity. And you kind of feel for them because you know them personally, they're great guys, but they just never really get there. But also in their minds, they have grandeurs or, uh, or, or, uh, or illusions that they're in charge. So remember the scene where she was like, yeah, so what I want you to do is sit down with my girlfriend. And they're like, what? <laughs> so I think, <laughs> like, yeah, my kid brother, go and sit down there and, you know, and not just uh, brother, but you're just, you've, you, you've, you've disappointed us so many Exactly. <laughs> and so I think the two of them, those two characters were very well written and very, very well staged. There was no point where there was any love between them until she died. And that was, that was heartbreaking. That was really good. And I think another thing that they did very well was they didn't show his suicide. Nigerian home movies, they would have drawn that out with a gun or him taking some tablets and choking to death. But they didn't. So I thought that was quite, that was subtle, that was tastefully done. Um, but clearly, he's been on drugs. Which is... <laughs> Sorry, I'm not though, because I'm, Maka, I, at some point says I killed your children, and then I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> no, no, but he, you know the conflict. He, so he was on drugs, and all these things usually always lead to some sort of you know that it leads down that path. So it was explained away quite nicely. His loss, his grief. His, the disappointment that he knew he was going to face you know, from his mom, the loss of his mom's power and you know, the, all the access to riches and whatever that he might have lost as well. And then the fact that the one thing that he thought he was doing well, which is his girlfriend, was actually the source of his pain. So I completely understand how he could have gone over the edge and killed himself there. So I, I thought those two characters were beautifully written and, and, and beautifully um, presented or acted as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, any, any last words? I wanted to go back real quick to a theme that I thought, um, and I wanted to talk about Makanaki's, what did Makanaki want? So if we, are we done with character? A mother, he had mother issues. Makanaki had mother, mommy issues. Hmm, okay, care to expand? He, he, he needed, he needed to be respect. He was, there's that little boy who like, wants to say, I'm strong, I'm, I'm able to do it. And he wasn't given the respect that he thought he deserved. Um, and even when he sort of brought something to the table to say, right, okay, I'm bringing this huge score, let's, let's have a go. She dismissed him. Obviously, she was having her own challenges at the time and didn't do deliberately. But he was a troublesome child. So I think his, his point was he wanted respect and he wasn't given the respect. He was belittled by her. Um, and therefore, he thought that he was going to take, he felt the best way was to take it by force. Hmm. It's just a li li literally classic little boy trying to fight his little corner, mommy uh, issues. I, I also thought he was challenging the status quo, right? Because she takes the lion's share of whatever proceeds they get from all their criminal activity. And he's like, no, why do we do it that way? You know, what? And, he, and he did it, he shared it equally, which I thought would make them, the members of this alliance, get behind him. So it was strange to me that they went back to her. I mean, she's taking 40% before anything else, before you guys share the rest. So that I was like, okay. So I, I, like, I felt like it was kind yeah. of an like old, new thing, traditional versus, oh yeah, more than, let's do something different. And um, that's what he was fighting for, I think. 
in some way. Anybody else have any thoughts on what they thought he was? Because I was just like, what do you want, Makanaki? What is it? Or I thought he wanted to be her. That I thought yeah. his goal was to be, if he couldn't get her approval, you're right in the sense of, yeah, I mean, it did come across like he had mummy issues. He wanted her respect, but he also wanted to be her. Um, he wanted her power, her position. Um, but again, uh, I think this is where a little bit of the story, uh, the, sto- the storytelling lets us down in that we didn't, we didn't really get that sort of, and I guess that's human, human nature. We don't really get that clarity sometimes when it comes to what motivates people to do what they do. Um, but I think for the sake of the movie, it would have been great to, well, again, you don't need to see his end goal, but to just get a sense of his ambition was to be, you know, take over well, uh, from her and be the next king. Um, and I think what would have been interesting would have been to set up a, a similar conflict. Um, you have um, um, Adiswa's character conf- um, having conflict with her brother and also having that conflict with um, Makanaki because that, those are her two siblings. Those are, those are the people she's jostling. One is, one wants to be in one wants to sit, sit at the table. One other, the other one wants to. It's actually in competition with her for that, um, for that throne. And so, it would have been good to see again more conflict in that sense, and less of the story, the other kinds of storytelling that I, I didn't feel was necessary. So, okay. Um, so we have about three minutes left. Um, wow. So yeah, so, <laughs> we are done. Um, any Jeremy, was there anything else? I know, I know, I had asked you to share some tips just about screenwriting, and even in terms of this film, like what suggestions would you have um, if you were looking at the script? Blah blah blah. I mean, I, I think that that it was a great script. To be really honest, I mean, I it, if any of my students were to write a script like this, I would be immensely proud and to go out there and, and make this movie um, that, that is so popular. I mean, it's, it's really quite an accomplishment. I think that, you know, a lot of scripts are pushed into production quite fast these days. And, and so, yes, you know, I'm sure um, Demi would have, or Kemi, sorry, would have said that um, she would have taken another pass or two at the screenplay. Um, what I really liked about this, a lot of times in screenwriting, you hear about like the three sacred C's, which are like character, conflict, and change. And, you know, even though, I mean, I think we talked earlier about like the complexity of the King of Boys' character. Um, and there was, there was a, quite a bit of conflict. You could talk about how maybe we, we would try to like simplify that a little bit, her versus Makanaki, um, and just focus on that. And then we get a two hour movie. Um, but there was a lot of change in all of these characters that I noticed, um, from the way they were introduced, um, in, in into the, the final scenes and the final images of them. Um, they all, it was obvious, went through this, this tremendous, epic, dramatic, tragic, um, like episode of their life. Um, and, and I really appreciated that because because it does set you up for the King of Boys too. Um, you know, th- there's there, there's a story there, and and I think it's I think it was well told. And so those three sacred seas of screenwriting, character conflict, uh, change, um, were evident throughout. Um, I think it always starts with character, and so I I appreciated uh, her character a lot. And I'm, I'm curious to see what they do with the, with the second film. Great. Thank you. But I'm going to say thank you so much, Jeremy, for joining us today. Thank you for watching. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll invite you again. So is that okay to invite you some other time in the future? Anytime. I love watching these movies. All right. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for watching this episode and see you next time.